First of all, uh, originally this is a talk that was given in um, uh, in the last uh, Grand Prix Trading Radar Conference, 2018 really. Uh, the last one in 2020, uh, GPR 2020, unfortunately had to be cancelled uh, because of the COVID-19 situation. Uh, now, uh, this is work that uh, is done by John Hartley. Uh, John, uh, unfortunately, cannot be with us today, uh, but he just completed his PhD uh, on uh, efficient subgrading and modeling uh, of ground penetrating radar uh, using FTTD uh, with an application obviously of all this into uh, GPR Max. So he's uh, submitted his thesis and he's uh, uh, very close to have it examined very soon. Uh, so uh, the idea of the presentation here is to explain a little bit about the Hawking subgridding approach uh, that is being used uh, to model efficiently ground penetrating radar with emphasis primarily of how to model antennas. That was what uh, John was looking into it. Uh, but obviously the applicability of a subgrading technique is, um, is really uh, quite uh, uh, wide in a way. So uh, one of the things I want to mention is that uh, uh, that was sponsored by an ICASE award, as we call it in the UK, between EPSRC and DSTL, and DSTL is the Defense Science Technology Laboratory in the UK. So uh, going further, uh, the motivation for subgrading uh, is a key thing that we have to discuss first, and then obviously what is the Jorge subgrading, uh, and actually what uh, uh, is termed here the modified Jorge subgrading or the switch Jorge subgrading that uh, uh, is basically what uh, John has, uh, uh, has created. Uh, show some numerical examples and read some conclusions. Uh, now, the subgrading motivation uh, in terms, for example, uh, of uh, antenna patterns, if you want to see that, uh, is basically uh, the ability to do uh, models that otherwise uh, wouldn't be able to achieve. Uh, the discretization step in the finite difference time domain model is defined primarily by two constraints. One is to maintain uh, the numerical dispersion error at, uh, at, at as, as small as possible. So to control our simulation that the numerical solution is accurate and is not contaminated with artifacts because uh, of very uh, coarse discretization in terms of the wavelengths of the electromagnetic waves. And obviously contain the other kind of error, which is obviously the coarseness error, uh, in essence modeling what we're supposed to be modeling. So sometimes we have uh, details in our models that are important uh, in, in order to describe properly the structure that is being modeled, uh, which have to be analyzed with small cell sizes, uh, because otherwise they're not going to uh, be representative of uh, the actual structure that we want to model. This constrains the model quite a lot. Uh, obviously, you have a constraint as well that uh, sometimes on high electric strength materials, you have to have very small cell sizes because you need to keep the numerical dispersion error under control. Uh, this again proves another stringent requirement, but uh, often there is a situation where uh, this condition, the numerical error can be uh, relaxed because the cell size can be, for example, uh, significant large to control this error, but the modeling of objects uh, is more stringent and requires a fine detail meshes. Uh, that creates a problem uh, where uh, we run out of computing space. Say, for example, in, in this example that uh, John has here, is basically when you have a real antenna pattern, when you want to really measure uh, the antenna pattern uh, at distance from the antenna, and the antenna it requires a one millimeter model, but you want to go a few meters away from this antenna to actually measure the antenna pattern closer to what would be a far field pattern, then you find out that this is really something that you cannot do easily without uh, having uh, extreme amounts of computing memory and computational time. In essence, what happens here is that you see that the memory requirements in gigabytes increases really very, very quickly uh, when you start modeling uh, big spaces with, uh, with resolutions of one millimeter. That is becomes almost impossible, really, 
uh, when uh, you see for uh, an example of a 10 by 5 by 1 meter region, it will require 6 terabytes of RAM. Uh, apart from the computational time that it will take that model, uh, it's really hard to envisage that you have a computer that has that much memory unless you're working on a massive big cluster uh, with parallelization techniques. So there is a lot of high computational requirements. Now, the, the key aspect here is obviously uh, when you see uh, that uh, uh, the reason that you have that is one it has to do with, uh, with stability and uh, maintaining stability for a small discretization step, uh, you need to increase the computational requirements substantially because your time step will be really uh, very small. So your simulation time uh, can be substantially large once you have a number of uh, uh, iterations that you have to do in order to achieve that. Uh, and obviously uh, the, the spatial step is control, as I said, about the, uh, the dispersion error, which is uh, you require at least what we call 10 cells for the smallest wavelength in order to control that error uh, effectively. If you can afford to have more cells per, uh, to analyze your uh, smallest wavelength, your, your solution always continues to, to improve. So uh, the final uh, requirement, apart from controlling the computational error, it is the geometrical step requirement. Uh, and here, if you, for example, want to, want to model a Gaussian excitation with a 400 megahertz uh, center frequency, uh, and you put a half space of relative primitivity of five, you find out that your maximum wavelength around that frequency can be 30 centimeters, uh, which uh, uh, if you go for a, a lambda of a 10 discretization, you end up pretty much uh, around with three centimeters uh, requirement for this frequency. However, if you're modeling an antenna, you still might be requiring one millimeter resolution to be able to model the antenna in a faithful way. So uh, while your objects requires a very fine resolution, uh, your numerics might uh, not require that kind of fine resolution. Uh, so uh, in essence, uh, in order to model properly uh, what you do, you have to abide by the finer resolution that is required in your model either for uh, controlling numerical dispersion or for controlling the faithfulness of the object creation or representation into, into your model. Now, how to marry these two requirements in a finite difference time domain methodology, uh, it is uh, to use uh, subgridding. And the way that will work is basically uh, embedding one grid inside another grid. People can obviously argue and say, oh, there are other methodologies in uh, computational electromagnetics or, or computational uh, approaches that actually can do multi-grid in one go. For example, finite elements uh, is a technique that actually su supports variable and structured meshes uh, that uh, can have uh, multiple scales of, uh, of sizes at the same solution. If obviously they do. Uh, they, what you do when you use this kind of approach is obviously uh, you lose uh, the computational efficiency uh, uh, that the finite difference method and it simplicity offers you. So you'll find out that a very big, sizable, complex, finite element representation of solution uh, of this size, uh, the computational requirements for it uh, will be really substantial. So it's really uh, important important to try to, to maintain as much as you can the simplicity of power of the finite difference time domain solution by combining uh, the, the two different messes together. So subgrading or combining two different res resolution messes together is the best way in FTTD type of methods to uh, increase the capability of having the ability to model things with finer resolution embedded in meshes that uh, they don't require to be as fine in other parts of your model. Uh, how you do that? Uh, you can combine two different FTTD uh, solvers, one that operates on the coarser grid, one that operates on the finer grid and join them together. Or uh, you might want to find out that you have an FTTD main grid 
and your subgrid is based on a similar FTTD technique, but maybe using a different type of finite different solver, uh, an alternative direction implicit solver, for example, an ADI solver, uh, where, for example, Dr. Diamante uh, did that for her PhD in a way, uh, and so that, that worked quite, uh, quite well. There are many ways to approach this problem, and in the literature, uh, there have been a lot of attempts and a number of successful attempts. One thing that I will say on the outset is that doing so, combining, say, for example, two grids together, it can never uh, easily be perfected. The reason is obviously uh, when you put these two numeric grids together with different numerical properties, uh, you have to maintain a seamless interaction of the fields going from one grid to another grid. And uh, always, obviously, there you have numerical errors that uh, uh, will be present because the numerical properties of these two grids uh, cannot and they're not and will never be identical in order to have a seamless interaction. So in essence, you try to minimize the errors uh, of the interaction on the boundaries of between these two grids in the communication using various approaches that uh, they are there. Uh, a number of approaches will be, for example, to try and, and join these two grids using interpolation schemes, which are uh, everywhere. Another approach can be uh, to try and use some more physical principles uh, behind this connection. Uh, the simplest way to connect them will be to uh, try and interpolate and find the formation in the boundary between two grids in order to be able to uh, find all the necessary information to propagate the fields on the small grids and the, on the main grid as well. Uh, but uh, these simple interpolation schemes that you can have on the surfaces that connect the two different grids are not necessarily performing very, very well, especially when you realize that uh, your ratio of subgridding is increasing. Here we see uh, what you call in one to three ratio. Uh, every big cell is uh, divided in, th in three smaller cells. Uh, but uh, uh, obviously this ratio can increase a lot more. Uh, you'll find out that uh, approaches that are based particularly on interpolation schemes, when the ratio increases substantially above five or seven or even nine, uh, then they start breaking down and the errors are increasing substantially. Uh, the approach that John took on this uh, work is to use uh, what we call Hoche subgrading, and Hoche subgrading was introduced by Jean-Pierre Berenger in 2006 as an idea. Uh, and this idea uh, was uh, really quite a powerful concept. Uh, is based on what we call in electromagnetics the equivalence principle. Uh, this equivalence principle, uh, it is really, uh, I mean, some people might know from the theory of electromagnetics what it does. Uh, it tells you uh, that it can allow you to um, if you know uh, uh, the currents that run on a closed surface, uh, then you can radiate and use them as sources uh, uh, into the environment and propagate the right fields if you know what these currents are, uh, are going to be. Uh, the way I think I should do that, uh, maybe if I... Maybe if I stop sharing this and uh, I'll stop sharing this for a moment. And what I'm going to do is uh, I'll change my video to, to the visualizer. Okay, so basically if I, I think it's better if I explain that uh, if you have a space uh, where you create a number of currents that run around in this, and these currents will be both electric and magnetic currents, uh, and these currents are defined, uh, which is a unit normal with a magnetic field, and that is another unit normal with an electric field. Uh, if I, th if this, this current depends on fields that I know, and I can predict them here, I can create radiation in this point inside uh, that can interact with objects and do anything it likes. And these currents, normally either I know them by formula 
or if I have put this in a bigger space, these currents they can be predicted by fields that exist in the in this grid. So the fields that exist on the big grid, uh, I can uh, give me this kind of currents that I can apply through the equivalence principle to excite something inside the smaller grid. Now, uh, in this space, the grid here is quite big, while here the grid can be very small. But the coupling mechanism is between using this kind of Hohen's principle, as we call it, or equivalence principle, when these fields that are in this grid uh, be represented by theoretical currents that run on this fictitious surface. This is not a real surface. It's just a boundary between these two grids. And the theory tells me that if I do this, this properly, uh, these currents will represent in here the fields that will have been going through uh, uh, without having any reflection. Now, that allows me to connect uh, the main grid to the subgrid, but obviously what I want to do uh, is actually take some of the, uh, of the fields that have been reflected, and I can actually try and use another pen here, that the fields that reflected and come out from here, and as they come out from the surface, I have another little surface that run different currents on it, uh, which again, uh, these currents run on this closed surface, and they depend on the internal fields that come out from this grid, which actually scatter and connect to the main grid. So I have these dual surfaces here that uh, work very close together. There are very few cells apart in a way and connect these two grids based on this equivalence principle. So if I go back to my normal video here, and share my screen again to what I was, uh, just give me a second. Uh, oops, no. There. If I just share the screen again and press that. So basically, this is the idea behind the Hohen subgrading that we'll employ here. Uh, and uh, it is really portrayed here in a one day situation. Uh, you have a, a narrow that, um, uh, I don't know if the, the mouse is, can be seen in this presentation, I suppose it can. Uh, so you see here one connecting surface uh, and then a second internal connected surface and another connected surface on that side and, and, and the other one uh, connecting again back to the main grid and allows the propagation of waves from one region to another region uh, without actually creating as much reflections. Uh, when we do this, we create what we call two non-working regions. This is a subgrid non-working region and non-working region and a main grid non-working region uh, which uh, uh, they are decoupled from our model. Uh, the benefit of doing that through this uh, theoretical concept if you like is basically that allows uh, to create uh, a lot of greater subgridding ratios. You can do a 1 to 99 if you like uh, uh, with a very similar performance that you're going to have when you have a subgrading ratio of one to three or one to five or to seven. So you can embed very fine detail into otherwise very coarse grids without creating massing reflections uh, into, the, into the process. Now, the, the problem with this approach that uh, you see at this slide, the standard Hohen subgrading as reported by Berenger, uh, is that although it performs really well, it has strong instability problems. So basically what happens, your solution becomes unstable quite quickly. Not, it, cannot, it can be used, but you have to be very careful of how long your simulation time needs to be uh, uh, because it's really a problem of stability with this methodology. What John introduced uh, and I'm not going to go into detail here because it will take us forever to actually explain the maths behind it. A modified or switched process where the roles of the surfaces 
as being defined by the original Behringer formulation are being switched and changed, the end result of being able to propagate and connect the two grids is unchanged. The role of the non-working regions is slightly varied, but still functioning as we need them to function. And therefore, this switched approach of the subgridding uh, creates a new uh, similar but different in a way uh, a theoretical framework of creating and joining these two grids based still on the equivalence principle. Uh, but the benefit of this new idea that John had is that uh, the stability properties of the new arrangement are a lot better. And even as instabilities do exist with this new arrangement, it's easier to control them uh, we are introducing some kind of what we call artificial loss mechanism in the connection process. So basically what that means is that we can retain the accuracy and efficiency of the Hoechen subgridding idea uh, without suffering as much about the instability problems that he had. And uh, that is uh, the methodology that is being now obviously uh, introduced into GPR Max and that's what we're trying to do and test it and make it easier applicable from the end user perspective. It's not just only a research project uh, and uh, is came to be uh, available in the new version. Now, if you want to, to, to see, uh, sorry, a, a, an example of that, uh, here is uh, the 1.5 gigahertz antenna that Craig said the mess of that. Uh, that is a, a over a half space of 3.4 uh, relative permittivity uh, and one millimeter resolution model uh, now, uh, the one millimeter resolution model uh, will run in the subgridded uh, example here in seven minutes, while the one millimeter model in the normal uniform grid will have run in 35 minutes. Uh, so you see that uh, this is really uh, very efficient uh, in a way, uh, both in terms of computational time but in terms of the amount of computational resource and memory that it will require. Now, when you compare the, the two uh, solutions, you see that uh, uh, when you see them, they obviously uh, plot one on top of each other. Is that the agreement is really excellent. And uh, the relative error at the maximum difference between these two solutions is uh, at the key point of where the response comes is uh, a little bit above 1%. Uh, which is really uh, very good in comparing relative error of performance of, of, uh, of subgrids. The, there can be no subgrid that will have zero relative error. This is something that we should abandon because that's not physically possible. We have to control and accept that the small error will be there when we do this kind of work. Another example that John did for that is to model a cross hole radar with two uh, resistive bow tie dipole antennas that are um, in these boreholes. Uh, and you see the number of materials that you have uh, in just in a layered uh, structure, uh, the air on the top, then the relative primitivity of 5, 12, and 18, the two boreholes and the two antennas. Uh, actually, doing uh, the, the model uh, would have been a, a very uh, substantial uh, problem to actually run one millimeter model of uh, this size will have required 3.6 terabytes of RAM to actually run this situation uh, in a full one millimeter model everywhere. The reason that we'll have used a one millimeter model everywhere will be that the bow tie discretization will require this type of resolution in order to be done properly. Uh, while uh, we don't really need this resolution uh, for the numerical dispersion due to the materials and the frequencies, because the frequency, the center frequency, for example, is 250 megahertz, uh, is rather relative low. Uh, and for that resolution, uh, a one millimeter model is an overkill in terms of numerical dispersion. However, it will, will have been needed if you needed to model the, the antennas properly. So 7.6 terabytes of RAM, 3.6, sorry, terabytes of RAM would be really big. Uh, if you do a 1 to 11 ratio, you find out that uh, uh, this is really more feasible uh, to actually uh, 
compute and, and run. Now, if you're going to see here uh, a, a close-up of that, you see how well the bow tie uh, antenna with a resistive profile, and you see uh, on your right-hand side the resistive profile that was used for this antenna uh, is depicted embedded in 1 to 11 uh, core grid uh, that you can, you can have here. So here is a, a thing that will run uh, the video. Uh, I don't know if, uh, oops, I don't really see anything in my screen. So I think the simulation video somehow is not playing. I don't see anything in the screen here. Sorry about that. Um, there's something probably happened with the PowerPoint. Uh, again, Another example that you can do here is, the, is using the 400 megahertz uh, GSSI model, uh, which was developed by Stedler and is available as part of the library on GPR Max. Again, this is a very big antenna. And if you want to do uh, an antenna pattern, for example, of this antenna, which is a 400 megahertz antenna, uh, and you may want to do a four by four by four meter space to actually do this, 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 uh, uh, this antenna pattern, Using a one millimeter subgrid resolution, uh, one millimeter full resolution, it will have taken 7.7 .7 terabytes of uh, of memory to do that. That is something that physically was impossible, actually, even to test and run this. However, doing a one to eleven again subgridded ratio, uh, when we use one millimeter for the antenna, which we really need, but uh, 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 eleven millimeters for uh, for the normal. Uh, space around the antenna and the, su and the, sub and the half space, uh, then you can do a 12 or gigabyte memory model for this massive space. And on a runtime of 20 minutes, you can actually achieve uh, the simulation that you want. And therefore, here you get uh, an antenna pattern uh, of a 400 megahertz antenna at a, a, a quite specific wide distance uh, from the antenna 1.78 meters, which you're trying to approach far field if you want to create an antenna pattern, which uh, otherwise will be intractable. So in conclusion, uh, what the work has been all about is introducing uh, what I'm going to say a theoretically quite complex uh, subgridding solution uh, based in a connecting two different grids using uh, the equivalence principle or what we call Hoyen surfaces. Uh, and uh, that creates a very powerful framework of combining these two grids together, allowing you to actually do very good subgrading ratios. The novelty of the work uh, uh, is primarily the showcasing on GPR, but altering the way the, the subgrading connection uh, was uh, introduced in the first place by Berenger uh, in order to make the stability of this approach a lot more stronger uh, and to take away uh, some of the limitations that this approach had when it was originally introduced, which was showing that performed really well, but because of unfortunate and stronger instability problems uh, would not allow people to actually use it efficiently. So. Uh, the new approach that John introduced solves uh, substantially this instability problem. It doesn't take it away. So when you use it, you have to be aware that that might happen, uh, but it makes it a lot more robust uh, as than the initial proposed uh, approach. And this is the one that is being introduced now in GPR Max and it will be available uh, in version 4 uh, when it's released. Uh, obviously, this is a research tool for a lot of people and for us as well, which allows a lot of new uh, capability uh, to do things uh, relating to inversion and modeling of bigger scenes when it incorporates very high detail, uh, both in terms of objects, but actually in terms of uh, the electric strength of materials. Another way to use, for example, subgrading is that if you have a small region of space that we have a very high uh, the electric strength, for example, you have a water pipe and you want to model uh, efficiently the, the, the high electric of water, which is a relative permittivity of 80, 
Using a subgrid in this area, you allow you to control numerical dispersion locally without having to have a very fine mess everywhere. So uh, all these are uh, good things that comes uh, into uh, GPR Max because of that. And a lot of issues uh, that the, the original formulation had has been revolved, uh, resolved and uh, it will be available soon. So I think with that, that concludes this presentation.